So, Scott, what is your definition of elite performance, high performance, specifically to yourself? To myself, um, I would say elite performance or high performance is, I don't want to start off cliche, but it's it's just bringing your best self to, to as many moments as you possibly can. I was going to say then to every moment, but I think it's impossible to bring your best self to every moment. Mm-hmm. So just trying to win the majority being the best version of yourself, trying to be day in, day out, and ultimately seeing where that that takes you. Yeah, you mentioned then, I agree, it is near impossible in terms of like bringing your best self every day. We we were just speaking off recording about, you know, having some downtime around Christmas. And you said yourself, you know, when you've pushed through that festive period before you sort of crash on the other side of it. How do you sort of, I guess more for yourself personally as a businessman, entrepreneur, how do you make sure that you're at your best for as often or as much as you can be and what do you tend to do and react to those days where you're not quite at your best yeah I think um obviously being a nutritionist the main thing that I do is try and eat well the majority of the time um but also something that I've learned over time is that it's all right to take your foot off the gas like if I have I mean, they're pretty few and far between at the moment, but if I have periods of downtime, even if it's one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon when most people are working, I don't punish myself for taking my foot off the gas, going for a walk, doing some exercise, or even just doing nothing at all, even if it's reading a book that's nothing to do with science. I actually find that finding those pockets to recharge actually really helps me to operate better, like more effectively, more efficiently, when I need to be a hundred percent on it. Whereas maybe when I was a little bit younger, I'd just try and do as much as I possibly could all the time. And if I had 5% battery left, I'd be like, right, I'm going to use this 5%. And then, you know, like we said, we said earlier, yeah, you know, it just then leads to burnout. And I tend to look at things more. So, you know, how has my week or month looked over a period of a longer period of time rather than short term um, and I think that's helped me to manage that mindset has helped me to manage my energy. I mean, it's something we talk to the athletes a lot about, right? It's mm-hmm. eat smart, train smart, recover smart. Mm-hmm. So it'd be a bit hypocritical of me to preach that and then actually not do it myself, which is really easy to do. But I think that's probably what's helped me is that that kind of new mindset, reframing the way in which I think about it and just not punishing myself for doing completely nothing sometimes at one o'clock it's not always one o'clock but like one o'clock in the middle of the day just to kind of recharge because it actually means I can be much more effective you know when I really need to be on it yeah and I think I agree with that that's something I did previously a lot where I was almost just filling my time with things nothing really productive but it just mentally was satisfying to know that I was always doing something whereas I'm, I'm actually a lot better now at like say taking 15 20 30 minutes to reset go for a walk, play with a dog, have some lunch, whatever it is, almost like reset. Um, And I've found a lot of those transitional times, actually. So driving from one session to the other or one gym to another uh, transition in terms of having a meal and then going into another session, just resetting in even those small moments helps me massively. Um, You you sort of mentioned there, well, a few things, but I want to start with the signs of burnout that you sort of mentioned for yourself. What are those signs and how early on do you tend to notice them? And what do you do if you do notice them? Um, I think it's different for each person, isn't it? But for myself, I just noticed that. So usually like throughout the day, I will. So my typical day is I'll wake up pretty early. I'll hop straight onto the Watt bike. I did about an hour to an hour and a half on the Watt bike. Managed to balance my laptop on it now as well as my phone so I can actually be productive while I'm doing it. Um, but I'm getting some exercise in and I usually just start with the easy kind of low energy tasks. So picking through my emails, my WhatsApps, um, yeah, just kind of getting back to people, looking at structure in my day or my week. Um, and then I have pockets of time that I set aside where I'm really into the deep work. So it could be, you know, doing athlete plans or working on business development or or something like that, where I just don't, I don't respond to any distractions. So I usually have my phone upside down, like I've got it upside down now. So there's nothing in the way. And that's kind of what helps me to get the most out of those, almost like the deep work pockets of time, whether that's an hour, two hours, three hours, one of the things that's really helped me the most is even within that, if I set aside a block of time for three hours where I'm really going to, 
use a lot of mental energy is just to take a 10 minute break every hour mm-hmm. because that allows me again, like you said, to, to reset. And that doesn't mean that I'll be straight onto my phone, getting back to people. I'll probably just go and do, you know, prep some lunch, have a snack, go for a bit of a walk mentally, just unwind a little bit and then get back to it. So I set alarms that go off that tell me now when I should be doing that. And actually that's something that's, yeah, something that's really helped. But when the, in terms of alarm bells for me, I just, I don't know, I just get knackered and I'm just not as productive. Mm. And I just noticed that, you know, it's not as easy to do those deep tasks, like the easy stuff, like your emails, your WhatsApps, whatever else is fine. Um, But actually when I know I need to make kind of big decisions or strong decisions, then I notice that it's just, it's just much harder for me to do that if I am burning out. Mm. Yeah. You sort of touched on almost like batching tasks there, which is something like I try and do myself just in terms of, you know, instead of filming a piece of content once a day for 20 minutes, try and get it all done in an hour on a Monday or something like that. And avoiding distractions is obviously a big one with that. And, you know, you probably have it yourself where things tend to almost just pop up. You can plan and plan and plan, but you might have those days when things just, I don't know, an emergency or a client needs help with something. How do you deal with those almost like chaos in those situations when you have a plan, but as you both know, things don't always go to plan. So you've got, let's say a two hour slot, you've blanked out to do X, Y, or Z, but something pops up. How do you navigate the sort of chaos that you can't control? Yeah, well, I just look at it as though, you know, in the space of a couple of hours, the world's not going to fall apart. Mm-hmm. And it's something actually with the Edge team, you know, I try to coach them and help them over time to, you know, not worry if you don't get back to someone within 30 minutes or an hour. You know, the world isn't going to fall apart. And, you know, if you, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, isn't it? And I think that's why I try and not turn my phone over sometimes. And I try and remove those distractions. You know, honestly, 99 times out of 100, when I do that, and then I turn my phone over, yeah, there might be a few things that have come in that are so-called emergencies. But I'll just get back to someone, I'll just say, hey, you know, just been in a meeting or just been doing some work, wanted to put you as priority. Um, you know, here's a workaround or here's a solution or let's have a call in the next hour or two, work it out. And also 99 times out of 100, no one really has a problem with that. I think the world that we all live in at the moment, especially with things like WhatsApp, where you can see, obviously you can turn off your blue ticks and your last scene and everything. You can't turn off your online status. Mm -hmm. So people obviously then, you know, there's a bit of pressure that if someone texts you and you're online and then you go offline and people might turn around and think, oh my God, you know, they've not gotten back to me. They were just on online. Like no one in my experience has ever had a problem with that. It's always been fine. I think it's the, the pressure that we put on ourselves internally as opposed to the actual external pressure that is what causes that stress. I mean, obviously, there's different things, certain scenarios like we know in boxing, if a fighter is just about to make weight or they've just weighed in and they actually are sitting there with a load of food in front of them and they're like, what shall I have? You know, obviously, they have plans before that, but if they, they want to start tweak to it, where well, you do need to get back. So there's certain times when I'd be like, okay, cool no matter what, I've got my phone on me. I know there could be text coming in at any moment for this particular person or fighter. And then I'll know to get back pretty quickly to them. But most of the time, day to day, um, you know, it's kind of just, yeah, I just follow that process. And it's been difficult to get used to it over time. um, But I think it's something that's really helped me. Yeah, I think I agree. That was one of the biggest improvements to just business, but in, in my life in general was, getting over the idea that I have to respond straight away because I used to go through WhatsApp. I'd reply to one person because I'm like, oh, they're a client. I better reply straight away. And then by the time you've replied to, say, five people, the first one's then replied to your reply. And you're just on this before you know it, it's like 20, 30 minutes lost. Mm-hmm. Um, and once you realize it's similar to like taking time off, that was something I really struggled with previously. And then you take your first holiday where actually I was a little bit anxious and checking my phone and da 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 but then you realize the business still runs, the world didn't fall apart and people don't actually care that you're taking time off. And if anything, they're actually quite happy for you that you are taking yeah. time off. So I think once you get over that, definitely it's a massive, uh, massive game changer. It sounds like from what you mentioned sort of a few times now that you're quite meticulous in the way that you plan your day, organize your day. What does that look like? Is it something you do the night before? Is it something you take time to do in the morning? Do you use a diary? Do you do it electronically? What's, what's that look like for you? 
Um, yeah, I'm pretty meticulous with it. I do like to plan, but also I'm pretty open to things changing. So mm-hmm. my priorities kind of change sometimes depending on like what you said, depending on what, what comes in. Um, but yeah, usually I kind of run it, like have a bit of a macro for the week ahead. So I'll know when my meetings are, I'll schedule some hours of deep work and then I'll schedule other hours where I'll be like, right, I'm going on the walk bike to be responsive to people. And then usually I'll leave a buffer either side of that for new things that will come in. Um, and then I'm just pretty flexible with it as well. I think I don't really put too much pressure on myself to be like, you know, this has to be my week and nothing can budge. Um, but usually to be honest, I just use, I, I keep it really simple. Um, I just use calendar on my phone. We've got a team calendar for all the, the edge team as well. So we can all see what we're up to. Um, and then just keep it really simple. Like, you know, my to-do list, I know you can get loads of different apps for to-do list now is typically just notes on my phone mm. and then I just categorize them. Uh, so I like to keep things really simple. I think the world that we live in at the moment, there are apps out there that can help with a lot of things. Um, but you know, so far so good in terms of just trying to keep it simple notes on my phone, use my calendar. Um, and then I've just got a couple of like pages docs on my Mac, um, that kind of, I can use checklists to kind of tick things off and then reorganize things. Yeah. I think the phone's a really good tool as well. Like it gets a lot of bad press, I guess, with social media and everyone's like, your phone's negative. It's ruining your life. But actually if you, you can silence those notifications for once so you're not seeing them. And it's a really helpful tool. Like I know on my lock screen now, something I look at quite often, I've just got like free affirmations of things I want to be. So being more present, um, keeping my energy levels high and just seeing that reminds me of what I'm actually trying to achieve. Um, so just little tools like that. Like I know phones get a bad rep, but they're not all bad. There are some really useful sides to it. You know, when you mentioned like um, about going on the walk bike in the morning, it sort of leads into morning routines and almost like non-negotiables a little bit. What are they? I guess you can answer them both separately, but do you have a morning routine that you you almost have to do because morning routines are really popular now? Unfortunately, most of them that you see are from millionaires who say, you know, they have four hours, they go and meditate for an hour, they go work out for an hour, they go to the spa for an hour, and it's not really feasible in an everyday life. So for you, do you have a morning routine? What does that look like? And do you have any sort of daily non-negotiables that you have to do regardless of anything else? Um, I wouldn't say there's any non-negotiables that I have to do that I put a lot of pressure on myself and think, you know, if I don't do this, it's all going to fall apart. But I do like to have a bit of a structure. So it really depends on where I am, what I'm up to. But for example, if I'm working from home, my preferred routine would be to get up, have a glass of water, make myself a coffee, then pretty much get straight on the what bike. Um, and at that point, I turn my phone over or turn my phone on. Um, so don't use my phone as an alarm clock, for example, because then when I get out of bed, I'm more likely to snooze it. I'm going to be reactive straight away. Cortisol is going to spike and I'm going to start my day on the back foot. So I don't like to start the day on my phone. I like to start my day 10, 15, 20 minutes without it. Glass of water, cup of coffee, settle into the morning, jump on the what bike, and then I turn my phone off airplane mode and I'm like, right, what's the damage? <laughs> what do I need to get back to? Uh, so I quite like that in the morning where I can get on the what bike and I can do an hour, hour and a half. And it's nothing intense. It's just pretty steady state. I think it's, what am I getting? About 200, 210, 220 watts for the hour, hour and a half, which is nothing compared to what you see on a daily basis, Reese. Um, but what it allows me to do is to kind of get back to people you know, like almost check things off my list that are pretty quick and easy wins, round off everything and then be like, right, okay, cool. Stepping off now, get in the shower and now I'm going to do my deep work for two to three hours. And then I'll probably have another period during the day where I'm responsive and I'm getting back to people. And then after that, I'll probably do another two or three hour block. And then sometimes I'll work the evenings, sometimes I won't just depending on what's coming. Mm. Yeah, I like that a lot. It's almost with my morning routine it it wasn't really a morning routine it's just something I naturally sat, sort of found myself doing I'd get up shower um dog walk and read 10 pages of my book and I keep my phone off for that whole period now and just by doing that makes everything else a lot more enjoyable and that first sort of 45 minutes hour of my day it was for like I can really control that first hour and get in those free small tasks I just feel like a better almost like I'm primed to then mm. produce better quality of work once I get into it um, but as I said, like a lot of the morning routines are quite complicated now and everyone's striving for these crazy ones where it doesn't have to be that deep. You can, you know, people get up, they make the bed. Some people don't. That's not like a defining mechanism to whether you're going to be successful or not. 
Um, I just wanted to go in terms of backtrack just very slightly because you mentioned as a nutritionist, which is your background, that you tend to, you know, eat well. What does eating well look like? Because I know a lot of sort of busy people who would say they eat well, which you might disagree with. <laughs> um, and I know I see a lot of people's definition and understanding of what eating well is can be actually quite a little bit away from what actually is eating well. So what would you sort of define as eating well? What can people include? What sort of food should they include? How, how would you navigate that? Yeah, so I think, mate, how long have we got? <laughs> um, but for me, I mean, I'll speak for me personally. So yeah. me, for me, eating well is the kind of the core principles or pillars of it are trying to keep on top of my hydration throughout the day. So for me, that's one of the biggest wins that I can have and also one of the easiest wins, right? Glass of water with each meal, glass of water upon waking, front load the day where you can so it's, you know, try and stop drinking quite as much in the evening time. So you don't need to wake up and disturb your sleep cycle and go to the toilet, uh, carry a water bottle around throughout the day. So you kind of subconsciously find yourself sipping away at it, keep it on top of your hydration. So I'm always a little bit more overhydrated than I am dehydrated. So it's just a really quick and easy win. Um, other things are aiming for like minimally processed foods. So trying to, you know, not have too many processed foods in the diet, having good variety as well, um, particularly, at lunch and dinner time uh, and then just being well prepared um, so preparing things the night before cooking a dinner with my girlfriend in the evening time granted she does the majority of the cooking I do the majority of the washing up um, <laughs> same, same. but but yeah just like literally we do one food shop a week we get everything in kind of map out our meals for the week um, include lots of kind of like high quality ingredients but with that i don't really mean they necessarily need to be expensive i just mean your kind of oats your quinoa your couscous your rice your pastas uh different types of protein sources so kind of like two to three different types of fish two to three different types of meats and then obviously just buying in a big bulk of vegetables and then just playing around with it in the kitchen and seeing what we can actually make um my breakfasts in the morning tend to be pretty similar i quite like an oat-based breakfast so i like to kind of fill up in the morning time um but then i'll just add different things to it like chia seeds flax seeds etc berries um different like types of milk alternatives um so it's not really something where i actually consciously count my calories or count my macros i think i've gotten into a pretty good routine and probably one of the good things that or key things that i do is just have flexibility um if i'm hungry i listen to my body i find that only when people tend to overeat or tend to eat junk do they wrongly crave more food when you have a high quality diet with good variety you don't tend to overeat too much such that you'll put on body fat for example it's much harder to do at least um so i tend to listen to my body i tend to eat when i am hungry um and then I'll eat regularly throughout the day. So I won't go too long without food. Um, and also just try and enjoy it. Like people say to me, oh, because you're a nutritionist, do you ever have a pizza? Do you ever have a burger or anything like that? There's, I think there's a huge social element to food as well that people often forget about um, that plays a massive role physiologically, but also psychologically too. Um, so, you know, when I was back home in Chester at the weekend, went out with the family, there's a menu. Obviously menus now have, the, well, the majority have all the calories on. Um, there was like a roast dinner with nearly 3000 calories. Mm. I was like, How on earth do you manage that? I think the yeah. butters, the lards and everything else they put on it. Right. But I just tend not to think about it. I just go for what I want because I can get that balance right of eating well, the majority of the time. And then if I'm going out, we're going for some food with friends or family or whoever it might be. I just have what I want um, because it's what I do consistently over the course of time that actually makes the most difference. Where do you stand on the calorie on menu thing? Because I'm very much torn. There's <laughs> a part of me that likes it because I can make more conscious decisions when I'm going out. But there's also a part of me that's like, I eat really well and I train hard. And when I go out to enjoy my food, I want to enjoy it guilt-free without seeing what's in it. Mm. Where, where do you stand of it just out of interest? Um, I mean, I say that like it's still difficult because even the restaurant we were at the other uh, over the weekend, even the starters, there's a starter that I wanted and I'll go for anything on the menu. I don't really mind. There's a starter that I wanted. And it was like eight, nine hundred calories. And I thought, is it really worth that? And then I was like, why am I having this 
discussion in my head or conversation like just have it you know it's not going to make that much of a difference over the long term right um but where i stand is i think it totally depends upon the person so i think there should be an option so you should have the option to see the menu with or without and then that way you can actually accommodate people's preferences so if they want to see it great they can and if they don't then you know there's a menu without that and leave it to the people's choice yeah no i I agree with that one question that just popped into my mind that i get all the time so while you're here might as well use your expertise where do you stand on intermittent fasting so whenever people message me about nutrition it's always like what do you think about intermittent fasting is it something i should do where do you stand on all of those and i guess a little bit touching on keto and all these different sort of fad diets you get what's your opinion on, on all of those um Man, hitting me with the tough questions. I know. I know. <laughs> Not that I have a massive following, but I might lose some followers. But <laughs> I, I kind of right the way in which I, when so we obviously work with a lot of elite athletes, but also kind of everyday folk as well as corporates and CEOs, etc. And we get a lot. A lot of the time, we get these questions, and the way in which I put it back to them is: Do you think it's a short-term way, but a long-term failure? So are you going to do something that, yeah, you can stick to it for six to eight weeks, but then after that, it's going to be really hard to stick to. And ultimately, you're probably going to end back up at square one. So a good example of that would be, um, you know, on Twitter, you see quite a lot intermittent fasting or keto diets where you completely eliminate carbs. You might be able to do that over the short term and it might work. Obviously, it depends upon what your goal is. Um, But actually, can you stick to that over the long term? And is it actually going to be a positive lifestyle shift for you? Or is it going to be a temporary thing? And probably nine times out of 10, when I put that to them, they'll turn around and say, oh, actually, do you know what? Good point. I don't think I'll be able to stick to this. I've gone through quite a lot of these cycles and different regimes, and I've never been able to stick with one. So then I'm like, okay, cool. Let's work on something that you can actually stick to for the rest of your life, as opposed to across the short term. It's a much better investment in time, money, and resources than actually pigeonholing yourself to one particular regime that you're let's be honest you're unlikely to stick to i think yeah and i think more has to be done from people in sort of influential positions that they're not putting out rubbish information because just yesterday actually i saw michael chandler put a clip out um and he's a ufc fighter very high profile someone who if he puts something out a lot of people are going to start doing what he says and he essentially put a clip out saying carbs are the devil cut them out and see how great you feel. And and a lot of people will cut out carbs off the back of that. So I think it's great that having people like yourself who are sort of getting into the general population and educating um, people on it, but more has to be done, I think, in terms of people in positions of power to not just put out information willy-nilly. But I guess that's the the sort of issue with social media and having influencers and, and that kind of things. But yeah, yeah, I always say to my clients, like, it's not well, it is rocket science, but it's not, you know, all of those different diets and different methods all have the same sort of principle behind it is that you're essentially in a calorie deficit. So fill your calories up with as much variety as you can. And like you said, tick all those boxes and the actual method itself is just what works for you. If you enjoy something and it works, then then do it. Um, Mate, just on that, the, 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 I genuinely think it's not, the the fundamentals of high performance nutrition are not that difficult it's Mm -hmm. not really rocket science and the science doesn't really change over the course of time um not not to a great extent anyway i think what people struggle with is two things so it's knowing what's best to do right you mentioned it there's so much information out there that there's like mass information, misinformation, which then leads to people being confused and you have choice paralysis and too many choices to make that you're kind of swaying in the the wind and there's no clarity in direction. So once you know what's best to do and you get clarity on that, it's actually being able to implement that and being able to do that consistently that is actually the really hard thing. Mm. So for example, like, reducing like eating regularly throughout the day in improving the variety of your diet improving the quality of your overall diet and you know periodizing maybe your carbohydrate intake relative to your daily energy demands uh you know on paper it seems quite straightforward but actually being able to do that especially when people are 
you know, super busy. Maybe they're traveling with work, going here and there. Plus they've got kids and they need to accommodate them as well. Like that actual implementation is what's really difficult. Um, but knowing what's best to do is is actually pretty relatively straightforward compared to what people make it out to be, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. Even from what I do as my background, I always say to like the guys, you're not paying for information when you, when you come to train with me because you could go on YouTube and you could find programs online. That's not the issue. Information isn't the issue. It's the implementing it and what time do you do this? What's the best way to get to that given result? And it's exactly the same like you're saying in the nutrition standpoint. Um, so you can take a side step away from you as a nutritionist, more to you as like a businessman. You mentioned you've got your team at the edge, um, which is going really well. What would you say as a, a leader in, in that business, what would you say is kind of things you have to do as the figurehead of a company? What things do you try and embody to your team um, away from sort of being a nutritionist, but more as a leader of that team? Hmm. I think it's something that being totally honest, I'm learning about every day, like coming out of university, you know, I was given some good opportunities to work in elite sport and then found that things were going pretty well. And we needed to kind of bring on board a bit of a team and then build the lab, et cetera. And it all just kind of happened. And I know one of the questions that you've got for me, or you may, may ask is like, what was the what was the lowest point for you? And I think, like to be honest, just figuring it all out, there's no playbook for it at all. Yeah, I don't... Talk about that while we're on it then, Scott. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been great, right? You see things on Instagram, you might see the, the lab that we have or the people who we support and everything else, and it looks all shiny. But you know, within that is, uh, similar for yourself, I'm sure, like an absolute slog and not knowing what is the best route to take and just literally having to make mistakes and spend a lot of money and lose money and then you know try and save for a rainy day and keep everyone happy keep delivering results with clients and keep moving that dial forwards no matter no matter what really um so i think within the team and my role as as a kind of leader is that to instill try and instill the passion that i have to to them but also let them use their own passions to support people um we don't really look at our results from a financial perspective we look at it from a have we helped to change that person's life for the better whether it's an elite athlete um you know an aspiring teenager for example a small family team an executive like how have we changed their life for the better and are they happy with our service because the way in which we've grown the edge over the course of time is not really on paid ads or marketing it's just referrals and that's how we've kind of grown it so if we can ha do a great job and go and above and beyond for the people who we support, hopefully, and hopefully this isn't my naivety, but the business side of things will take care of itself. And that's how we've managed to grow it. So I think with the team, I like to give them, I'm always there to support them. So no matter what, I'm there. And if they need to call me, they can. Um, so to try and give them direction, but also to give them that flexibility to, you know, have some autonomy, have lead leads on their be leads on their own projects for example and just take it by the reins and and like instead of me saying guys this is exactly how we should do it just be open to their suggestions let them contribute let them have their own lead projects that they can take pride in they can have their own results that ultimately benefit all of us and it's very much a kind of team approach led or spearheaded with a passion to try and change people's lives for the better yeah, employing the right people is key in, in any organization because essentially as the leader, if you employ the right people, you don't really need to lead as much. Um, it kind of just looks after itself essentially. And then you kind of guide people and almost lead by doing your role as you'd want it to be done. Um, with that, with that tricky period when you say like financially financial stress is trying to build your way up. And did you ever have any self-doubt in that situation? Did you ever have those days when you think, oh man, I don't think this is going to work out? Or did you have any any of those situations? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I, I did and I, I did and I didn't have self-doubt. I think with me, like I've never really given up on anything unless I felt it was right to give up on it. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, going down a particular business route and then realizing it's not worked or it's not working and then having to make that decision to cut it off and just go and try you know door b or door c for example um 
so I kind of think that, but over time, as I've kind of gone through those hard times, like a good example would be, I was about Christmas time a couple of years ago, and we were going through all the terms, and conditions, privacy policies, cookie policies, et cetera, whilst lots of other different things were going on. And I had to kind of like review everything and I thought God, I don't even know much about like mm-hmm. legal side and we had a good law firm everything else and but I still had to like lead that as well as so many other things my phone was constantly blowing up my emails were blowing up I always like to get back to people I don't want to leave anyone hanging you've got kind of students who are reaching out to me saying hey can I get some work experience or can I pick your brains on something and I always want to try and get back to as many people as what I can and I just remember sitting there and I was like almost having a bit of a breakdown being like, I can't keep up with all this. Mm-hmm. And my values, like core values are that I want to be there for people who need me. And I kept saying yes, yes, yes to things. And it just ended up, you know, me like pretty much nearly having like a bit of, I, I don't really know whether I was having a breakdown or not, but it was just a really difficult time when I was trying to please so many people. And I think from that, I learned two things is that if I say yes to everyone, then actually the quality of my yeses will slip. So actually, sometimes it's better to get back and just say, you know, not right now, but I'd love to help in the future. Can we touch base in a few months time? Let's see. Um, And then also it kind of just helped me to build resilience in that. You know, I knew that if I'd gotten through all of that, then anything new that happens or comes up now that's similar in business I can get through it. So now I just think, oh, well, I've gotten through all that in the past. So this new fire that I need to put out, it's fine. I've gotten through more shit than I have like this before. So mm-hmm. I can just get through it again. And it kind of, kind of gives me that self-confidence really. Yeah, I like the end to the answer because I was going to lead on to, did that teach you any lessons? And and usually, you know, when you're going through a bad time, whatever it is, there is a lesson to take out of it. Um, So I think it's really good that you sort of naturally just went into what the lessons were because I'm very much like that. I'm always very grateful for difficult times because even in in the middle of it, if I'm going through a time where I'm like, right, this is a real struggle at the minute, I'm always very grateful for it because I'm like almost excited that there is a lesson about to come that I know is going to accelerate even myself and my business further in the like coming months. And what I always try to do is when things are going really well, I try and remind myself, right, this won't last, ride this wave, but eventually it's going to drop down because and when I am going through it, more of a difficult time I just apply that same principle of this isn't going to last the good time didn't and the bad time won't even you sort of stay in a neutral ground it just makes it a little bit easier to navigate your way through those difficult periods yeah well the way the way I think about it is typically if I'm going if there's a day or a period of a day which is particularly difficult and there's something that I think are it's either really stressful and I can't keep up or I'm not sure how the hell I do this and I've got to try and figure it out and it's quite stressful then there's two things I think. I think, well, there's no value in stress. So I think, okay, this is the problem. What's the solution or how how can I find the solution? And sometimes it's impossible not to be stressed, but I try and dampen it as much as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. And the way in which I do that is I always think, okay, by the end of the day or definitely by tomorrow or at very most the end of the week, I'll be somewhere, I'll be running, I'll be driving, I'll be somewhere and everything will be absolutely fine. So it always works out like okay so what's the point of me being really stressed right now just crack on try and find a solution and bring in people if you need help yeah that's why i always try and remind people as well like every single previous time in your life it's worked out yeah. like, because if it hadn't you wouldn't be in that situation where you are now so past experiences would show you that it's going to work out again you just got to keep sort of doing what you're doing in order to get get through it um You sort of mentioned, obviously, well, not then, but through difficult times, things like your support network, relationships, family, they're really like important thing to help you get through those friends as well. How much emphasis do you put on sort of creating your team, um, having your circle, one that's going to support you through those times, as opposed to being like, oh, you know, why are you working so much? Come and chill out why are you not coming out with the lads we've had that as well or even like past relationships miss like oh you've not been out this weekend we've not done anything I can't keep doing how do you build your circle is it something you do consciously or is it a subconscious thing uh I think it's 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 interesting right because you touched upon it before with um 
you know, you see things online, which is where entrepreneurs only get three hours sleep or four hours sleep, and then they just keep going. And you know, the actual gene um, for be like that people have in order to be able to get away with like a five hour sleep is like one in a million people can actually do that and function well, right? So I I just tend to think like, you know, I'm not putting too much pressure on myself to, you know, work all hours of the day. I more so look at it as though I've got blocks where it's exceptionally high cognitive energy that I can make some really big decisions and, and, and get shit done basically and get it done well. And then around that, I try and schedule downtime and I don't feel guilty for having the downtime. And then within that, obviously, it's seeing friends, family, um, you know, kind of so-called support network and, and trying to, you know, see people. Now, I grew up in Chester, um, Northwest, and then I currently live in Solihull, so like South Birmingham. So actually, a lot of my friends and my family are either in Chester or they're up towards where you are, like Leeds, Harrogate Way. So then it's a decision of, okay, well, it's going to be a two hour, three hour journey to go and see them at the weekend. It's quite difficult actually to be able to fit in so many friends and family. And then you get to Friday and you're like, right, I've got to travel up to Chester or Harrogate now. I'm going to get there for nine, 10 o'clock. Then on Sunday, we have a Sunday dinner together. Then we travel back. So it's, it's difficult to, it's difficult to manage it and to please everyone. But what I found is that, you know, with, with friends or my mates you know the if they're the really good mates stick around and if you can't see them for a few weeks or even a few months you know that the next time you see them it's going to be class and mm. it's going to be just like it was before mm. and also the other thing is that something you mentioned about being present i think one of the greatest gifts you can give someone is just being present with them mm. so although i might not see my family or my friends all the time or as much as what i would like i make sure that when i do see them or I try to make sure that I'm as present as possible. So if I'm going golfing with my dad or out for a meal, I just won't even think about work. Mm. And I was just trying to take myself completely away from it. And what I found is that, again, something you mentioned is that when I mentioned that to clients, there was one client who was messaging me about uh, 7.30 on Friday, 7.30 PM. And I was in a bit of a text exchange with them. And then I said, oh, by the way, I've got to go going out for uh, dinner with the family, with my mum and dad. Um, and they were just like, oh, no worries. Have a great time. Like previous me would have been really nervous to be like, oh my God, I'm about to cut off a client and they're pretty high profile and everything else. And they just completely understood. And then I just enjoyed the weekend and I just prioritized it on Monday. And I just got back to them and said, hey, back in office now, wanted to put you as priority. Here's what we can do about it. And they were really happy. Would you say you've got good balance now? Better balance than what I had. I think it could, it could always be a little bit better. Um, but I think part of my part of me is that I really like to push the boundaries of things and I like to test test myself in terms of like what because the agile started with a blank piece of paper and I want to see where we can take it and how many people's lives we can impact and what we can all achieve together as a team. So part of me is like just keep going, keep going, because I want to see what I and what we can do. But then the other part of me is thinking longer term and thinking, well, in order to do that you need to schedule your periods of rest and have a bit of a social life and everything else. So it's a bit of tug and war with it, I suppose. Yeah, it's actually funny because for me, balance was always, right, I've worked for eight hours. I need to have X amount of hours there. That was balance. But actually, I realize now that balance isn't actually a time thing. It's more of a quality thing. So even if I am at work from, let's say, just typically nine to five, but it's like when I get home in the evening, if I'm with the girlfriend, it's like, right, you get only two hours, but... I'm in that two hours, I'm 100% there, we'll go for food on the weekend, whatever. And I think a lot of that, something I'm getting better at now is almost like just communicating. Like, so she knows, for example, right, I'm at work at these hours there, unless it's an emergency, there's no point of even trying to get in contact with me because I'll be giving you one word answers. I'm just not going to be there and you'll probably end up getting annoyed. Whereas, right, this time I finish work, if you want to call, call me there. And in that half an hour chat, I'm, I'm 100% in it. Or we're going out for dinner on the weekend. I'm 100% there. I'll leave my phone at work. So I think just communicating and actually realizing like balance isn't a time thing has massively, massively helped me. Um, what I want to do, and this one, we're going to stick with your entrepreneurial head rather than nutritionist. It's our closing questions that I ask all my guests you work obviously with a lot of elite level athletes as well so you can use that experience but yourself as an entrepreneur as a businessman what's one thing 
you would say that people to reach an elite level have to do? And what's one thing you would say they have to avoid in order to reach an elite level? One thing, uh, I'd say one thing that people should, I'd recommend that they do to reach elite level, which of course is relative to each individual, right? Mm -hmm. Is to have a good support team and take advice from a small number of credible trusted sources who yeah who you can trust you know they're good high quality source of in, of information and can actually help you um we interviewed chrissy wellington who's the four times ironman world champion about her career and she said that with her nutrition she took advice from one person the whole of her career She's like the same as psychology, the same with this, the same with that. She's like, it made my life so much easier. Just simplified everything. Mm. And I just think, wow, that was actually really powerful advice. So I mm. think that's probably the one bit of advice that I would give. And in terms of uh, what not to do, um, take advice from influencers, specifically as it relates to nutrition and s &C, <laughs> because it can be dangerous. Um, but don't overcomplicate things. Like try to keep things as simple and as easy to do as possible. Realize that what makes what works for one person might not work for you. Um, and just focus on focus on one thing at a time. Don't take on too much so too much at once. So with nutrition, for example, don't think I'm gonna try and overhaul everything on Monday because it's really unlikely to stick. Just try and do start very small and then build progressively from there and try and turn it into a way of life as opposed to a short-term fix. Perfect. Scott, thank you so much. I think people find that really useful. Appreciate your time. Nice one, Reese. Thanks, mate.